Good afternoon, no, not ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Montesquieu Forum. Uh, this is our fourth lecture uh, this year, the third that is in our Origins and Founding series. In the autumn, we had a lecture by Professor Ron Berger on Moses. Uh, we also had a lecture by Professor Charlotte Thomas on the Odyssey. And our third lecture in our Origins and Founding series is this afternoon. Uh, our guest speaker is uh, Professor Clifford Orwin, who is a professor of political science at the University of Toronto. Uh, in 1994, he published a wonderful book, widely and justly praised on the humanity of Thucydides and deciding that rather than beginning at the beginning of Greek historians, he should begin at the end and then go to the beginning. Uh, over the course of the last eight or 10 years, he has been working on Herodotus. Uh, but to say this is to say very little about Clifford Alwyn because it might suggest that his range of inquiry is limited, but it's anything but. Anything that is a subject of serious human inquiry is open to the can of his investigations. He has studied and written on Nietzsche, on Montesquieu, on Rousseau, on themes such as pity and compassion. He has worked on Jewish themes, especially through the trajectory of the work of Josephus. Uh, Everything he touches perhaps doesn't turn to gold, but it turns to something very fine. In addition to his work as a scholar, Professor Orwin is an exemplary teacher. Uh, in 2003, he was a winner of one of the Best Teachers of the Year Award at the University of Toronto. In the award that they gave him at that time, they noted that he kept up to 15 hours per week of office hours. Uh, this causes embarrassment to some of us who perhaps keep that many hours in a month. Uh, it gives one some pause about Professor Orwin's own neurotic genius, but irrespective of that, it shows his extraordinary dedication to his students, one of whom uh, is here today and can uh, testify to that. Uh, Clifford Alwyn is an all-around wonderful man, and we are privileged to have him at the Montesquieu for him. Uh, today, he will be lecturing on uh, Athenian and Persian Empire, uh, as Herodotus presents it in his histories. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcome Professor Alwyn to the Montesquieu Forum. I want to thank uh, Stuart for that very generous introduction. Um, I have cut back on my office hours, now hold only a reasonable number. Um, his, uh, his account of the breadth of my interest reminded me that most things that I touch turn into not yet published manuscripts, so it would also be rational to do something about that. Um, although this is my first visit to Roosevelt and my first affiliation with it, it has long had a place in my heart. Uh, my mother, uh, who was born in 1922, received her long-delayed <coughs> bachelor's degree from Roosevelt some 60 years later. Her father, who had seen no reason to spend his hard-earned money on the education of daughters, had permitted her one semester of college at the University of Wisconsin in 1940, which he deemed sufficient for her to find a husband. Having eventually succeeded at that crucial task, although not during her four months at Wisconsin, my mother had settled into life as a housewife. Only after my brother and I were out of the house did she find time to resume her education under the aegis of Roosevelt's Returning Scholars Program. My mother's affection for Roosevelt led my father to accept the position of Director of Plan Giving in the Office of Development and Alumni Affairs, a position that he held in the early 90s after his retirement from running his own business. When he retired from his Roosevelt position, he received, among other memorabilia, a blue and green Roosevelt sweatshirt. I have to think those are Roosevelt's colors, which I inherited um, and have continued to wear to this day. Um, I like to think that there might be two or three chairs in this very room 
that Roosevelt owes to my father's efforts as a fundraiser. So I'm really happy to be speaking here. I'm less happy to be speaking in a series in which I was preceded by Rhonda Berger and Charlotte Thomas, two hard acts to follow. On the bright side, I'm speaking on Herodotus, an author whom I've come to love and I'm, on whom I've been hard at work this year. I hope that those of you who have been studying him with Professor Warner have come to love him as I have, and that those of you who haven't yet done so will find our enthusiasm infectious. For the benefit both of those of you who have studied Herodotus and those who haven't, I've introduced some comparisons with other thinkers who may be more familiar to you. Now, speakers in this series have been asked to provide versions of our lectures for publication in a book on the theme of foundings, ancient and modern. Founding, or the making of regimes, is indeed a major theme of Herodotus, as is their undoing or breaking. As he remarks at the very beginning of his work, um, great human societies have become small, and small human societies have become great. Happiness never remains long in the same place. The remainder of Book One, immediately following this passage, recounts the founding of the Mermnidae dynasty of Lydia and the rise of Lydia to a great empire. All of this is just prelude, however, to Herodotus' account of the defeat and absorption of that same Lydian empire by the nascent Persian one, which had previously supplanted the Median one. So Herodotus, who takes the long view and encourages his readers to do so, has considered many comings and goings from the human scene. True, he lived a hundred years too soon to chronicle the final demise of the Persian empire at the hands of Alexander the Great. Still, he had lived to see not only the Hellenes repulsed of the invasions of Darius and Xerxes, but the subsequent rise of the Athenian Empire and the several decades of strife between Athens and Sparta, culminating in the war that we call Peloponnesian. It was apparently 10 or so years into this latter conflict that Herodotus completed and published his history. So while the last of the events of his main narrative had occurred more than 50 years before, the minds of his readers, like those of any readers, would have been preoccupied with more recent ones. Herodotus wrote about resistance to one great empire for an audience embroiled on one or the other side of a war of resistance to another one, and he would certainly have expected them to look for relevant parallels between the two. Nor is the comparison between the Persian and Athenian empires a merely implicit theme of his work. For just as the Persian one still stood at the time that Herodotus composed his work, no longer at its peak, but still, but still ready to exploit to its own advantage the strife between Athens and Sparta, so the Athenian one had grown from the events that he describes. Indeed, so rapid was the transition from the Athenian liberation of those Hellenes subject to the Persian yoke to the imposition on them of the Athenian one, that Herodotus could not have portrayed the former without having also thereby recounted the early stages of the latter. We can go further. The rise of the Athenian Empire may or may not have been inevitable, but it certainly had not been inadvertent. The gleam in the eyes of such great Athenian leaders as Miltiades and Themistocles had not been limited to the survival of their city and the liberation of others. On the contrary, they had foreseen that from the ashes of the Persian supremacy in the Aegean would arise their own. Even more to the point, Herodotus presents the very origins of the Athenian democracy fully 35 years before Xerxes' expedition as itself implying an eventual empire. Xerxes' invasion then pitted not just an oriental despotism against a coalition of free cities, but a mature empire against one struggling to be born. So it's hardly surprising that Herodotus' work should feature an implicit comparison the two. So we'll begin at the beginning of the older and less innovative of these empires. In book one of the history, as already noted, the nascent Persian empire rises on the ruins of the Median and Lydian ones. Empire is an old story in Asia, the inhabitants of which, as Herodotus presents them, embrace a zero-sum game notion of politics. There are only two choices for peoples as for individuals to rule others as a master does slaves, or to be ruled by them as slaves are by masters. Politics in the Hellenic sense, which requires learning both to rule and to be ruled in a manner that is not despotic, is barely an option for these Asians. For this reason, the Persians feel not the slightest qualms about striving to subject others just as they themselves were previously subjected. 
At Cyrus's birth, the Persians find themselves under the sway of the Medes, the empire du jour in West Central Asia. By the time of his death, they have not only unseated and replaced the Medes, but dominate Asia from India westward. Now, it's similarly an aspect of this zero-sum model of rule that the Persians acquiesce so readily in despotism. As the Persian people, a master people, rules other peoples despotically, so its members submit to being ruled despotically by one among them. To us, children of a liberal anti-despotic tradition, originating in Locke and Montesquieu and adopted by our founding fathers, submission to the will of a despot is the very definition of slavery. Herodotus's Asians, however, see nothing incongruous about the subjects of a despot congratulating themselves on their freedom so long as their king rules not only them, but through them other peoples as well. Consider the exchange of Astyages, the deposed ruler of the Median Empire, with Harpagus, the general who has betrayed him to Cyrus. Astyages, a harsh and arbitrary despot if ever there was one, rebukes Harpagus for having thus put an end to the freedom of the Median people. If he was going to desert Astyages, the deposed king lectures him, he should have conspired with another Mede rather than with a Persian foreigner. For so long as they were despotized by one of their own and held sway over other peoples, the Medes had qualified as free. Such is also the view of the Persians. Although their despotic Median masters had been succeeded by no less despotic Persian ones, they revere Cyrus as their liberator and count themselves no less free as a people for living so abjectly as individuals. Can we point to a founding moment of this Persian empire, which as such is most revealing of its character? Well, this is the sort of thing in which Herodotus never disappoints. At book one, chapters 125 through 126, Cyrus, planning his revolt from Astyages, considers how best to attract his fellow Persians to his insurrectionary banner. Convening the leading tribes of the Persians, Cyrus provides them with scythes and sets them to a day of hard labor clearing a thorn field. On the following morning, having ordered, having ordered them to bathe and return to him, he serves them a sumptuous feast. He then asks them which day has pleased them most. Not surprisingly, their answer foreshadows the wisdom of Sophie Tucker and Ronald Reagan. They've been poor and they've been rich, and rich is better. Cyrus explains that the thorn field is a parable of their life of subjection to the mead, while the day of feasting is a taste of what awaits them once they have ousted and replaced the Medes, and so they do. Herodotus's Persians are a rational people. Rationalism, indeed, is their keynote. Cyrus's speech is clearly an appeal, the earliest on record, to the principle of enlightened self-interest. The Persian Empire doesn't stand for anything, if by that we mean some principle or creed. Unlike the great modern empires, whether British, French, Japanese, Hitlerite, or Soviet, it doesn't even claim to stand for anything beyond the Persians' determination to rule. It exists for their benefit alone, and so to the detriment of that of their subjects, and they do not pretend otherwise. While we may find their rapacity appalling, their honesty is either shameless or refreshing. Take your pick. The passage of Herodotus, this passage of Herodotus, clearly inspired a parallel one in Xenophon's education of Cyrus, and this last in its turn, chapter 16 of Machiavelli's Prince, the hero of which is good old Cyrus. Some of you, I hope all of you, will have read the Machiavelli. If so, you'll recall that chapter 16 offers a critique of the Aristotelian view of liberality, conceived as a mean and giving, giving neither too much nor too little, nor to everyone, but only to the deserving. In line with the radical revision of virtues that Machiavelli has offered in the immediately preceding chapter 15, he reinterprets liberality as not a virtue to be grasped and cherished in its own right, but as a means to political success. The semblance or appearance of the virtue thus effectively supplants virtue itself. That prince is liberal who achieves a reputation for liberality, it being the reputation that is useful for political success. And this Machiavelli shows is to be gained not by the practice of the virtuous Aristotle that preached it, but by the Aristotelian vice of extravagance backed up by the even worse one of rapacity. For one gets a reputation for liberality only if one gives in a big way, and one can afford to keep giving only if one keeps taking. 
Ensign's taking from some of your own subjects to give to others is a fool's game. The key is massive rapacity at the expense of outsiders. We know this last is empire. Cyrus is Machiavelli's poster boy here, precisely because craving a reputation for giving, he organized his subjects into an army of takers. Having thus, with their assistance, looted the Persian's neighbors, he divided the spoils with them, thus receiving credit for having distributed the property of others. Had Herodotus anticipated this lesson of Machiavelli's? Yes, he had. Um, check out, um, in book one, the exchange between Cyrus and the recently defeated Croesus, the Lydian king, over the disposition of the spoils of what had so recently been Croesus's empire. Watching the Persian soldiers pillage the Lydian capital of Sardis, Croesus ingenuously asked Cyrus to describe what is happening. The Persians are sacking your city, replies Cyrus. It's no longer any city of mine, responds Croesus. That's your city they're plundering. Here it is Croesus rather than Cy Cyrus who states the Machiavellian insight, but Cyrus picks up on it readily enough. Croesus goes on to explain that if Cyrus permits the Persians to glut themselves on the Lydian spoils, they will become arrogant and unmanageable and end up contesting Cyrus's rule. So control of this division, even or precisely in the case of an empire that rests on no other principle, is crucial to despotic statecraft. While inspired by the example of Herodotus and Xenophon Cyrus, the Machiavelli of chapter 16 goes further. He inaugurates the distinctive modern relationship between politics and economics. Machiavelli's very justification of empire or expansion here is an economic one. The goal is a perpetually expanding economy. Hobbes and Locke, the fountainheads of the liberal tradition, junk the imperialism but preserve the emphasis on economic expansion or the appeal to enlightened self-interest conceived as economic interest. They seek to redefine the ruler as the servant of the people rather than its cunning manipulator. Rule becomes merely government, even self-government. The Persian Empire, as Herodotus presents it, may foreshadow this development, but it does not realize it. For Cyrus and his successors remain despotic kings who, as such, retain the lion's share of the plunder for themselves. It was they to whom the wealth of the empire flowed and they from whom it trickled down to others. And what they were ready to give, they were just as ready to revoke. Not only did the riches of the despot dwarf all others, but others enjoyed what they had only at his sufferance. Consider the very feast that Cyrus presents to the Persians as emblematic of their future happiness. However sumptuous such an event may be, the relation of guest to host is not one of equality. The guest has no say in determining either the menu or the size of the portions. He takes what the host offers him. Persian despotism is a balancing act. On the one hand, the despot must give with a generous hand. On the other, he must never let the, 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 the recipients forget that they owe him their absolute submission. There was one simple rule for success in the Persian Empire. Please the damn king. Virtue came to mean whatever was required to impress the monarch, and impressing the monarch was what each ambitious Persian set out to do. Everything for the king and each for himself. There was no common good in the vast Persian realm, merely the good of the king and the wealth and honor to be derived from pleasing him. Maximum visibility therefore became the aspiration of every Persian grandee and the desire of each to seem devoted to the despot could easily usurp the reality of such devotion. As the king remained sole arbiter of the fortune of every individual, an obvious problem of coordination developed. Success in warfare among civilized peoples commonly depends on cooperation, less on individual heroism than on a team effort. The Hellenes proved to excel in such efforts. Yet again and again, in the course of Xerxes' expedition, the desire of the indiv individual grandee to shine obstructs all such cooperative effort. At Salamis, even as the king's scribes punctiliously record the name and parentage of every captain who distinguishes himself, the fleet falls into utter disorder as each freelances in order to be noticed. The black comical apex of such self-defeating efforts is the exploit of Artemisia the she-tyrant of Herodotus' own city of Halicarnassus and a member of the king's expedition. Finding herself in a tight spot and no other way of escaping it, she sinks not a ship of the resisting Hellenes, but of a fellow ally of the king. 
Fortunately for her, none of the crew of the ship thus sunk survives to accuse her before the king, and his scribes, assuming that this ship must be the enemy's, after all, it was Artemisia who sank it, mark her down for great credit with him. There were, to be sure, occasional cases of heroic virtue among the Persian grandees. These were the Persian counterparts to the likes of Leonidas and the 300 Spartans. But while the highest Hellenic virtue was civic, Persian virtue, even at its peak, remained that of a courtier, obsessed with his status in the eyes of the monarch. This might call for going to the greatest lengths, including even grotesque self-mutilation, the case of Zopirus at the end of Book Three, or the immolation of oneself and one's entire family, the case of Bogus in Book Seven. There are no deeds that the Persians admire so highly, and not surprisingly, the leading cheerleaders here are the kings themselves. The question is whether there's not something slavish in such self-destructive devotion to a despot. Self-obliteration for the sake of the approval of one's master, that would rub any Hellene the wrong way. In any case, as Xerxes himself comes to recognize, there's not nearly enough of this kind of virtue to go around. Expecting such devotion from all the grandees who accompanied him on his expedition, he receives it from only two. As for virtue at the base of the pyramid that is the Persian Empire, there is none. The kings knew no better than to presume on the loyalty of the subject peoples to the empire or their zeal in fighting its wars. It's established usage that in dealing with the subjects, the passion to be reckoned on is fear. Xerxes' host crosses the Hellespont, not only under his watchful eye, but under the lash as well. Deeming fear the great motivator, the Persians see it as the great equalizer as well. In their view, however, it does not level our Hobbes, but elevates, making the listless or cowardly fight like brave men. Where fear is universal, universal the Persians seem to think, martial virtue becomes almost superfluous. Xerxes makes no distinctions of quality among his vast host beyond the few thousand picked Persians who compose his royal guard. guard. All the rest are javelin fodder, called upon to fight and expected to prevail, but only by virtue of the whip at their backs and their overwhelming numbers. In one of the most famous passages of the work, Xerxes expresses his incredulity that the Spartans will fight at Thermopylae without being subject to despotic compulsion. The Persian Empire thus rests on the thirst for personal distinction of a few and the fear of chastisement of a great many. It's important then to recognize that Persian imperialism, as Herodotus presents it, does not rest on any appeal to patriotism or the divine, or to any such notion of national fate as our American forebears called manifest destiny. No, the Persians of Cyrus's day, under his helpful guidance, saw their chance and took it, preferring the feast to the thorn field. Their descendants see their chance and keep it. Their subjects obey because they see no alternative. It's that simple, that selfish, if I may say so, that reasonable. Still, I wouldn't want you to think that Herodotus was some proto-Marxist who regarded the roots of imperialism as economic only. Far from it. The thirst for rule, whether as evinced by the Persians here or by other parched peoples in Herodotus, is not superstructural, to borrow a Marxist term. Rule isn't merely a means to scratch an economic itch. Better to say that, that a lust for acquisition is itself but an aspect of a broader urge to rule and wealth just one of several benefits accruing to those successful at gratifying it. The Persians, for instance, are at least as keen individually and collectively on honor as they are on riches. Their victories, of course, determine their relative share of these in the struggle among nations, while their despot remains the arbiter of the share due to each Persian individually. Not surprisingly, there is no esprit de corps or collective sentiment among the, the, um, the Persian grandees, only cutthroat competition for the favor of the king. A last and ancillary foundation of the Persian Empire may be described as theological. True, I denied just a few minutes ago that the empire rested on an appeal to piety, and I'm not retracting that denial. It does find support, however, in a certain characteristically Persian view of the divine. On the verge of Xerxes' great expedition, he exclaims that having conquered Hellas and after it the rest of Europe, quote, 
we shall show to all a Persian empire that has the same limit as Zeus's sky. For the sun will look down upon no country that has a border with ours, but I shall make them all one country once I have passed in my progress through all of Europe." End of quote. The Persian gods are primarily the cosmic ones, sun, moon, and stars, the elements of fire, earth, and water, and those other forces of nature, the winds. As each of these deities is universal, the Persians not implausibly enroll them as allies in their own project of political universalism through world conquest. The sun, we may say, sets a bad example for man by traversing, and if only metaphorically, ruling the whole vast vault of the heavens. Xerxes aims to follow suit by establishing an earthly dominion coextensive with that vault. The sun will never set on the Persian Empire. We'll return to the Persian Empire, but now let's turn to the foundations of the Athenian one. These are coeval with, and indeed indistinguishable from, those of the Athenian democracy. It wasn't just that Athens, after the Persian Wars, happened to be both imperial and democratic, but that its thrust as a democracy was imperial. We find this hard to grasp, since we deem imperialism undemocratic. But as we'll see, Athenian notions of democracy differed from ours in this respect as in so many others. Let's turn then to Herodotus' perplexing account of the origins of the democracy. Readers of the Republic will recall that in its imagined history of regimes, democracy dissolves into tyranny. Socrates presents this sequence as natural and irreversible. In the actual history of Athens, however, if Herodotus is to be believed, tyranny had yielded democracy. How had this happened? Herodotus offers a surprising answer. Sometimes bad things happen to bad people. Athenian democracy represents a promising tyranny gone terribly awry. I'll try to sketch this out. It's the oldest story in Hellenic politics. A tyrant, actual or aspiring, identifies the people as either vehicle or obstacle to this ambition. Cleisthenes, the reputed father of Athenian democracy, fits this pattern to a T. The Alcmeonids, to whom he belonged, were among the families of notables banished by the Pisistratids, the old Athenian tyrants. During the reign of Hippias, Pisistratus' son, the Alcmeonids joined the other exiles in seeking to return to liberate Athens. We may sur surmise with some confidence that by liberation, these signs of old families meant no more than the deposition of the Pisistratids and the restoration of their own predominance. After many vicissitudes, the exiles finally prevailed. In this, Cleisthenes had played the crucial and crooked role. He had bribed the Pythia, the priestess of Apollo at Delphi, to enlist Sparta on their side. This gambit having succeeded, the gullible Spartans had expelled the tyrants. Predictably, however, the exiled Athenian notables had deposed their common enemy only to fall to discord among themselves. Cleisthenes faced off against one Isagoras, the son of Tisandros, Finding himself worsted, he allied himself with the demos. Cleisthenes' situation at this stage recalls that of the early Pisistratus. He too had made of the people the vehicle of his tyrannical ambitions. Rather than model himself on Pisistratus, however, Cleisthenes turns, or so Herodotus claims, to the example of his maternal grandfather, Cleisthenes' tyrant of Sicyon. Herodotus writes as if Cleisthenes Jr. did just what Grandpa had done before him. He notes two obvious parallels between their conduct and leaves the rest of the analysis to us. In fact, even these parallels merely serve to underline the vast differences. What the older had undertaken to maintain a tyranny, the younger did to establish one. But while the former had succeeded in maintaining, the latter had failed at establishing. The common elements of their politics were two. Each did away with the traditional names of the tribes of his respective city, and each did so with the intention of distancing that city from the branch of the Hellenic race to which it belonged. Cleisthenes of Sicyon, always feuding with neighboring Argos, had undertaken a comprehensive program of de-Argification, Argivification. This included the extraordinary step undertaken in defiance of the Delphic Oracle of supplanting the city's principal hero cult with one free of all Argive associations. 
As for the traditional names of the tribes of Sicyon, he had replaced these because, being common to all Dorian cities, they were so to both Sicyon and Argos. Having renamed his own tribe rulers of the people, he dubbed the other three the Swinites, the Assites, and the Porkites. <laughs> Clearly, um, this old coot neither cultivated the affection of the people nor pretended to be its champion. Far from fostering a civic spirit, his revolution of names ratified the people's servility. They were to view themselves as subhuman in their unworthiness of freedom. Even his own rulers of the people tribe was to know only the reflective glory of having nurtured the tyrant to which it was no less subject than the others. <coughs> Evidently, self-esteem matters, just as your high school guidance counselor told you. It took 60 years after the death of this older Cleisthenes before the Sicyonians mustered the dignity to exchange these names for more becoming ones. How then did the younger Cleisthenes imitate the elder? Most simply, by also changing the names of his city's tribes. Indeed, this is the very first and indeed the only thing that Herodotus mentions in elaborating his claim that when worsted by Isagoras, Cleisthenes turned to the people for support. Later, Herodotus suggests an even more precise parallel. As the elder Cleisthenes renaming had expressed his contempt for his fellow Dorians, so that of the younger had expressed his contempt for his fellow Ionians. The older tribal names at Athens had been those common to all Ionian peoples, while the new ones were, like those at Sicyon, distinctive, thus implying the same separation of the Athenians from their notional kin. So far, so good, but we have to be dim readers indeed not to notice how different were these two schemes of innovation. For Cleisthenes of Athens did not merely rename the existing tribes at Athens, rather he abolished the existing four and replaced them with a new ten. These ten, moreover, were founded on a radically new basis. They were not hereditary clans, which as such perpetuated traditional patron-client relationships, but geographical subdivisions. Your tribe was now merely your neighborhood, as such shared with all your neighbors. Whereas the elder Cleisthenes had debased the tribes at Sicyon, the younger had ennobled the tribes at Athens. He had leveled them upward, of which nothing provided clearer evidence than the names that he conferred on these tribes, each that of a local demigod like a hero um, with, with one divine parent. What Donald Kagan has remarked of Pericles, that his noble vision of Athens represented a, a democratization of kudos, or Homeric glory, and so an extension of aristocracy to the entire city, seems no less true of Cleisthenes. Yet Cleisthenes was not Pericles, the unchallenged leader of an established democracy. He was the aspiring tyrant of a city in flux, long rich in actual and aspiring tyrants, a city in which even the legislation of the wise Solon proved merely a prelude to the reign of Pisistratus. Nothing was less predictable than the emergence of the Athenian democracy, nothing apparently less intended by its unwitting founder. Cleisthenes' program for gaining the support of the people was so successful that it cost him his tyranny. Hoping to lure the Athenians into servility, he taught them to see themselves as worthy of freedom. So the best things in life are accidental. There could be no greater proof of the glorious, though unintended, success of Cleisthenes as a founder of democracy, or of his ignominious failure as a would-be tyrant, than his disappearance from the pages of Herodotus's narrative. There will be just a single further reference to him, and only much later at Book 6, Chapter 131, there mentioned in passing as the son of his father, Megacles, he is identified as having, quote, established the democracy and the tribes at Athens, unquote. No doubt he was so remembered, but it's worth noting yet again that here in Book 5, Herodotus' own account of these events offers no suggestion that such was Cleisthenes' intention. Nor is this all. Just as the remainder of Book 5 contains no mention of Cleisthenes, again, after the description of his reform, he simply disappears utterly, so there is no reference to any other Athenian leader. <clears throat> Herodotus' focus rests entirely on the transformation undergone by the Athenian people as a whole, as a result of Cleisthenes' reforms. No longer putty in the hands of factional leaders, the new Athens is distinguished by a remarkable unity and an extraordinary burst of public spiritedness. For the remainder of Book 5, the Athenian people is not just the main, 
but the sole actor in its democratic drama. In the heady months following the establishment of the democracy, whatever the Athenians do, Herodotus describes simply to the Athenians. Where they succeed, they succeed as the Athenians, and where they fail, as when easily gulled by the Milesian shyster Aristagoras to participate in his doomed Ionian revolt, they fail as the Athenians. Mostly, however, they succeed at administering sound rubbings to their enemies. It is this success that evokes Herodotus' famous praise of their new regime. While striking in many respects, it is so not least as a frank statement of the democratic roots of Athenian imperialism. Herodotus writes as follows. So Athens had increased in greatness. It is not only in respect of one thing, but of everything, that equal participation is clearly a good. Take the case of Athens, which under the rule of tyrants proved no better in war than any of her neighbors. But once rid of those tyrants, was first of all by far. What this makes clear is that when held in subjection, they would not do their best, for they were working for a taskmaster, but when freed, they sought to win, because each was trying to achieve for himself. This is book five, chapter 78. I've used, as always, David Green's translation, but excellent though it is, I have revised it because I'm so picky. The word that I've translated equal participation is isagorie, literally an equal say. This is the term that Herodotus chooses to use to describe the new regime at Athens, not democratie or the equally common isonomie, equality before the law. Of the different features of the new order then, Herodotus chooses to stress common deliberation. Foremost among the prerogatives of equality and freedom is an equal say. Like modern egalitarians from Hobbes to the present day, Herodotus extols liberation with this crucial difference. For him, liberation of acquisitiveness is not accompanied, as for the liberal tradition, by a repression of the desire to rule or dominate. By freeing us from the rule of others, in Herodotus's presentation, democracy liberates our whole selves. Freed from rule by others within the city, we naturally turn to ruling, not individually but collectively, pursuing the maximum advantage of our city over other cities, an advantage in which each of us now shares equally. Equality within the city thus favors the aggressive pursuit of supremacy among cities, now that each citizen experiences the cause of the city as his own. This explains why, from the very beginning, democratic Athens makes no real distinction between preserving its freedom, first from its Hellenic neighbors, soon after from the Persian invader, and encroaching on the freedom of others. As in politics, as in any other contest, the goal is not just not to lose, but to win. A particularly striking case in point does not even wait to occur until after the victory over Xerxes. It happens 10 years earlier, after the victory at Marathon over the smaller and less ambitious expedition of Darius. Miltiades, to whom that great triumph is due, immediately asks for a fleet from the Athenians, promising them much loot in return. The Athenians cheerfully acquiesce, without even bothering to ask against whom he plans to sail. His target is not a Persian one, but the impeccably Hellenic island of Paros. Having later learned this, the Athenians will punish Miltiades, because the expedition has failed, and the freedom of Paros, as well as his treasury, remains intact. As you can see, there is a clear parallel between the foundations of the Persian Empire on the one hand and those of the Athenian democracy on the other. Each represents an explosion of popular energy, the catalyst of which is a great leader, Cyrus in the one case, Cleisthenes in the other. In both cases, this leader sought to mobilize the people to serve his own ambitions. Cyrus succeeded at this, but Cleisthenes failed. In Persia, Cyrus and his despotic successors retained the initiative and the people played no political role. In Athens, the people seized the initiative and retained it. While to all appearances, Cleisthenes had aspired to be a tyrant like the Pisistratids before him, once his reforms were in place, the people would have no further truck with tyranny. The two empires then were variations on the same theme. Each was an expression of the fundamental human preference for one's own good over the good of others. 
In Persia, however, that preference was as highly stratified as the society itself, ranging from the monarch's thirst for global dominion to the foreign subject's fear of the lash. The grandees aspired to generous shares of the royal favor with the honor and wealth that attend it, while the Persian commoners at least enjoyed bragging rights over the subject peoples. Of Athens, however, it seems no exaggeration to say that the Cleisthenic reform, by freeing the Athenian peoples from rulers, had set them up as one. Like Athens' Hellenic rivals, both before and after the Persian Wars, the Persians would learn to their sorrow the crucial difference between themselves and the Athenians. That, freed from the constraint of fighting for anyone but themselves, democratic peoples fight harder. Thank you. One might, um, on the basis of Thucydides, one might argue for greater importance of the war. But, um, but in Herodotus, it is extraordinary how they are in an imperial trajectory from the very beginning. Not just, you know, that they're engaged in constant wars with their Hellenic neighbors. Well, all right, the, the Hellenic cities were always squabbling among themselves, so that's nothing new. But I think that that incident with Miltiades right, is extraordinarily striking. Um, also, uh, well, going back even further, the fact that the Athenians joined the Ionian revolt, which is a very, very foolish decision, and because King Cleomenes of Sparta had previously refused to join the revolt, it inspires in Herodotus, um, in Herodotus the wry remark that it's easier to deceive 30,000 people than one because Aristagoras had been unable to defeat Cleo deceive Cleomenes, but he had very easily deceived the entire Athenian people. As Herodotus presents it, it's not even clear that anyone in Athens opposed this notion. But it turns out that one of the reasons why the, the, the Athenians were keen to sign on for this was that they already regarded themselves as at war with the Persians. I mean, you know, the Persians who've hardly heard of them, by the way, at this point, you know, which is made very clear in the work. Why was this? There's some fancied slight they'd received at the hands of the Persians. And the Athenians already regard themselves as somehow equal to the Persians and are, are, are you know, eager to take them on. So one could actually read them as the aggressors in the Persian War. And in fact, Herodotus does. He says of the Athenian decision to send these ships uh, to participate in the Ionian Revolt, this was the beginning of great evils for Hellenes and barbarians. Now, there are other scenarios, there are other ways of reading the account of the war, but he does, at least at that, in that context, lend his patronage to that one. So the Athenians are clearly on an Athenian trajectory, right? And then there is the case of Miltiades, which is actually absolutely classic. It so much foreshadows the relation of Themistocles to the Athenian people and the later tensions with Alcibiades, because Miltiades you know, has just won this glorious and completely defensive victory. Though, before the battle, he has to persuade the Palomar um, to cast his vote in favor of battle. And what he says to the Palomar is, you know, if we don't fight the Persians now, we'll lose the will to resist, and great evils will befall the city. But if we fight the Persians now and defeat them, our city will rise to greatness. 
And so already, right, Miltiades sees that the defeat of the Persians is going to be a watershed um, in, in, in Athenian history in a different way. Then subsequently, this, when he, the, the next day, as it were, he, he asks for this fleet. And this, too, is just sort of classic Athenianism. You know, you've got the very ambitious leader, the people who are very willing to acquiesce you know, in the ambitious schemes of the leaders, and without you know, deliberating very carefully, again, they don't even ask him against whom this, this expedition is intended. And there's no way of, of reading that, right, except as, 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 as naked aggression. I mean, that no argument is ever made that you know, there was any, any way of interpreting other than that, or that Miltiades had anything in mind other than another notch in his belt, as it were, and the large sum of money which he promised to extort from the, 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 the enemy and bring back to Athens. So um, in, in Herodotus, I think one can almost say that while the Athenian victory in the Persian War was certainly a necessary condition of their pursuing their imperial schemes further, they really are on an imperial trajectory from the very beginning of the democracy. Professor Tarkov. Uh, if, if I understood that your conclusion, you, you said that uh, democratic peoples like the Athenians fight harder for their share in empire than despotic peoples like the Persians fight under the whip. Where do the Spartans fit in who seem to fight harder than anybody and not, and not at least as I understand it, for empire? I wish that I knew the answer to that question. That is, I wish that I knew the answer to the general question of where the Spartans fit in in Herodotus. Because, um, although I, I regard myself as having a long way to go to understand Herodotus, that does seem to me to be a, um, a, a great problem. I mean, one can ask difficult questions about various non-Hellenic peoples, how they fit into Herodotus' scheme. But within his presentation of Hellas, it's not so easy to answer the question of how the Spartans fit in. In this respect, though, I would say that Herodotus has a certain sympathy with the position of Socles the Corinthian, who gives a speech in the work, which I regard as the most important speech in the work, and indeed as the turning point in Hellenic history, as Herodotus presents it. And one could almost say the turning point in the history of the West, if you think that the defeat of the Persians right, was such a turning point. Because that speech by Socles the Corinthian is addressed to the Spartans, and it's intended to deter them from attempting to restore the Athenian tyrants after the Athenian democracy has emerged, and after it's shown itself to be such a threat to its neighbors, including the allies of the Spartans. And the Spartans repent of ever having expelled the Athenian tyrants. And they've now summoned their allies um, to help them to restore them. But Socles delivers a speech in which he makes a kind of quasi-Montesquieuian distinction between moderate regimes and tyranny or despotism. What's to be avoided is tyranny or despotism. And whether you have oligarchy or democracy doesn't so much matter. He doesn't discuss the distinction between oligarchy and democracy at all, only the distinction between tyrannical and non-tyrannical regimes. That's important because, of course, many of the Spartan allies, most of the Spartan allies, are oligarchic. And obviously, as is Corinth itself, and Socles wouldn't have persuaded them if he had made the argument simply for democracy. So he, he, he in effect, says that the distinction between oligarchy and democracy is secondary. I think that that is ultimately Herodotus' view, which is to say the crucial thing for him is whether or not there's whether or not the common exists. And the common exists in both oligarchy and democracy. In both cases, of course, it's a restricted common because in both cities you have many who are not citizens, more non-citizens in an oligarchy than in a democracy. But the crucial thing is that there be a common. Um, if Athens possesses extraordinary power, it's by, by virtue of having broadened the franchise, broaden the realm of the common, as it were, right, to, embrace, to embrace all free men in the city or all free native um, residents of the city. In Sparta, the common is much more restricted 
but the Spartans make up for that by um, you know, their, their um, extraordinarily strict training, which ultimately Herodotus presents as, in a rather Rousseauian way, as the um, strict ascendancy of public opinion in Sparta and the complete subjection of every individual Spartan to that public opinion. Now, that being the case, um, the question does arise as to why Sparta does not go down the same road as Athens. I would say that Herodotus implicitly, though only implicitly, I, and I, I, I can't find any sort of locus classic or sort of smoking gun for this interpretation yet, implicitly offers an interpretation which somewhat anticipates Thucydides. But I think that Herodotus' stress is not on the, um, the, the, the ever-present threat posed by the Helots, but rather simply on the relative fewness of the number of Spartans. Well, his suggestion being that given that the Spartans um, are always having trouble mustering the necessary number of troops um, and um, you know, forced, therefore, to resort to the, 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 the helots um, to fill out their ranks in a time of crisis, um, that, in fact, leads them um, to pursue um, a relatively conservative policy one that focuses single-mindedly on the survival of the city uh, rather than on its expansion. I mean, something like that seems to be his implicit interpretation. Um, but again, that's not something that I would want to commit to writing because I'm really not entirely sure of it. That, that is Machiavelli's representative Yes, no, you're, 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 you're quite right. And, and again, um, there's relatively little emphasis in Herodotus on the threat posed by the Helots, but there is a lot of emphasis um, posed on the fact that the, um, the, 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 the Spartans, like the U.S. Marines, right, are a few good men, but I think fewer even, the, significantly fewer even the, than, than the U.S. Marines. This, this comes up again and again. It's a point of great pride for the Spartans, but obviously, the, you know, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a mixed blessing. <laughs> for them to be as few in number as they are. Only from the Spartans to what is the role, do you think, in Herodotus of the divine in this process? Uh, periodically, we see these little eruptions of miraculous events that don't seem to be, that seem to be expressions of fate in some way. And do you think these are important for Herodotus? Is he trying to tell us something throughout the, the story of I was aware when I was writing this talk that I made a fundamental tactical error. Although perhaps you would have asked this question even if I hadn't made that error. I raised the question of the role the divine played in the Persian Empire and its character, um, thus begging the question of what role you know, it plays in the case of Athens and the other Hellenes. The, the answer to that question is a very long one. Um, with regard to the specific question you asked, I would say that there's considerable evidence that Herodotus does not, in his own name, um, attest to um, divine intervention in human affairs on behalf of the Hellenes, or for that matter, attest to divine intervention in human affairs at all. That having been said, after in the first few books, having um, planted very great doubts um, in the minds of thoughtful readers as to whether that notion of the divine is, is, is and that the relation of the human and the divine is a coherent one. In the last books of the work, he readily acquiesces um, in all kinds of stories, um, but never offering them in his own name. And he says again and again, the fact that I report something doesn't mean that I, that I credit it. Now, I think that for him, it is a, a fundamentally important political fact that the Hellenes understand the divine they do. And I think that the reason that he's so indulgent of the Hellenic understanding of the divine, having first planted radical doubts about it, but then in the course of his narrative of the Persian Wars, more or less going around with the, you know, the most incredible 
the stories that the cities tell or the intervention of the local deities on their behalf, um, is that he does regard it as highly salutary politically. And really, this was the most important element that was missing from my talk, simply because of lack of time. I decided since it was not possible to deal with it adequately, I shouldn't deal with it at all. But there's no doubt that um, what we would call human dignity, what we would call human dignity as an aspect of human self-understanding, that is to say that human beings understand themselves as dignified. There is only one people in Herodotus that possesses that human dignity in that sense. That is the Hellenes. The, the, the Persians, the Egyptians are wonderful in many ways. They're wise in many ways. They're impressive in many ways. But um, they lack that understanding of the human um, that makes political freedom possible for human beings. And certainly in Herodotus's view, the fact that the Hellenes possess it um, is, is inextricably bound up um, with the kinds of gods that they worship. Very different from the Persian gods on the one hand and the Egyptian gods on the other, less plausible to reason, I would say, than either the Persian gods on the one hand or the Egyptian gods on the other, um, but politically very um, effective. Not to say that there aren't political disadvantages to the, to the Hellenic gods, there are, but on the whole, the advantages of having this kind of gods far outweigh the disadvantages. So that would be, that, that, that would be my answer, um, that what's least plausible about the Hellenic gods, namely that they're so human, that, 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 that their relations with human beings are, are so close and that they're so human themselves, um, turns out to be the key to, um, since, I, since I used the phrase self-esteem earlier somewhat ironically, it turns out to be the key to um, Hellenic um, self-esteem. You know, that when they look up, uh, they see gods who are so much like themselves unlike both the Persian and the Egyptian gods, who have virtually nothing in common with human beings, it seems. And um, on the other hand, you know, who also do you know, set them um, a, a high standard you know, for, 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 for what it means to be human. What I find most striking about the relation between the Hellenes and their gods, which plays such a crucial role in the Persian War, is that it's symbiotic. Not only do the Hellenes expect help from their gods in defeating the Persians, but they find regarded as incumbent on themselves to help the gods in defeating the Persians. Because the gods, because they have local shrines and temples you know, which have been, have been sacked by the Persians, the, the, the Hellenes feel themselves obliged to come to the assistance of their gods, even if they counted the gods coming to their assistance. And that turns out to play a very um, important role in rallying those troops who can be rallied you know, to oppose the Persians against the overwhelming odds that they face. Um, I could say much, much more on this subject, so be grateful that I'm not. <laughs> Thucydides dominated and preponderated. He was the great Greek historian. Uh, Herodotus was thought, and I may be wrong about this, but was thought a kind of interesting, uh, the, our first anthropologist uh, with a lot of loose, crazy stories. And now this is switched greatly. Uh, and I think, it, uh, I, and I judge this by things like the Times and the very supplement and attention, and by Clifford Orwin's now working with book on Herodotus that the attention is somehow switched, and Thucydides is kind of walking off stage, and Herodotus is coming on in some major, major way. And that all Herodotus needs now is for us to go to war with Iran, and we should buy up every copy of Herodotus. <laughs> uh, this is jokey, but historiographically, is it your sense, too, that there is this switch in emphasis between the two great historians? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I'm grateful to you for giving me a personal stake in a war with Iran that I did not, that I did not previously possess. Um, no, you're, you're, you're quite right. And since we intellectuals like Persian grandees you know, are hungry for attention, 
I think that if I published in 1994 a book on um, Herodotus rather than Thucydides, I'd be world famous instead of famous only at Roosevelt, although that's, that's something. Um, I'm, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, that has its good side and its bad side. The, the good side is that there is renewed uh, attention to Herodotus and more attention to him as a serious writer and serious thinker, which he certainly deserves. The bad side is less attention paid to um, Thucydides. But I think that the ultimate reason for this change, significant change in intellectual fashion, is not so much political as intellectual or political slash intellectual, that it really has to do with postmodernism. That Thucydides had for a long time the reputation of being the first modern, aka scientific historian. There's something right about that, but it's mostly wrong. But anyway, he was stuck, he was stuck with that reputation. And what's happened in recent years, um, beginning with, uh, well, maybe not beginning with Robert Conner's influential book, but Robert Conner's influential book, which you asked me to review, for which I'm very grateful, um, was certainly an expression of this. There's um, an interpretation of Thucydides as a postmodern, um, postmodern interpretation of Thucydides, which makes him more relevant, since postmodernism is who's relevant, but which also makes him, I think, less central and less compelling. Now with Herodotus, Herodotus lends himself much better to postmodernist interpretation than Thucydides, because everything in Herodotus is narrative. And I agree entirely with that. Everything that a Persian says in Herodotus has to be understood within the context of the Persian narrative of the world and various sub-narratives. Everything an Egyptian says has to be understood in the aspect of the Egyptian narrative of the world and various sub-narratives. And for that matter, everything a Hellene says is um, almost everything is part of a Hellenic narrative that has an Athenian side and a Spartan side and so on. So Herodotus lends himself to that kind of interpretation. If you think that narrative um, is king and should be recognized as king in human intellectual discourse generally, that Herodotus um, would seem to be your man. So you're absolutely right. There has been an extraordinary um, efflorescence of, of interest in writings on Herodotus lately. Whereas of Thucydides, you know, I'd say that there have been some good things written on, uh, on Thucydides lately, but you're quite right that the study of Thucydides seems to be on the, uh, you know, on the downturn and that the study of Herodotus is very much on the upswing. But as I say, I think that's mostly for what I regard as the wrong reason, <laughs> namely that he's just much more to the postmodernist taste than Thucydides. So even if you torture Thucydides into a postmodernist vise, he still doesn't have the attractiveness to postmodernists that, uh, that Herodotus does. true that they write about very different things in many respects, but they also do write both of them about Athens and Sparta as cities and as way, ways of looking at the world. And they certainly share some uh, observations. For example, Herodotus, at the end of Book 5, seems concerned to show that the Spartans are always very slow to move and, and because of their the, uh, omens or whatever. And Thucydides shows something similar of Sparta. So I wonder if you would say a little about whether you think there are any serious disagreements between the two historians about the two cities. Yeah. Um, I think that Herodotus takes more seriously than Thucydides does the fact that Athens is a democracy. Um, that is to say, the fundamental fact about Athens for Herodotus is that it's a democracy. I don't think that's the fundamental fact about Athens for Thucydides. And therefore, um, one can say that ultimately, even Themistocles plays a somewhat lesser role in Herodotus than the, uh, the great Athenian leaders play in Thucydides. With Sparta, the emphasis of their treatments is so different that it's, um, yeah, as you say, they're explaining the same symptoms, 
some extent, but the emphasis is very, very different. For instance, one of the things that makes the discussion, the discussion of Sparta and Herodotus so um, unusual and so difficult to grasp, in Thucydides, there's no discussion of the role of the family in Sparta to speak of. Right? Whereas Herodotus' discussions of the Spartans have overwhelmingly to do with the role of the family and the strange role between public and private um, in, 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 in Sparta. Um, going together with that theme is Herodotus' emphasis on the kings in Sparta. Um, there's no particular emphasis on the kings in, 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 in Thucydides' account of Sparta. Um, in fact, the, there's very little stress played, uh, stressed um, on the political role played by the kings, whereas um, in Herodotus, there's very great stress on it. I mean, my view is that their fundamental takes on Sparta um, are quite different, more dissimilar than their fundamental takes on Athens are. But I'm, I'm you know, somewhat um, hindered in going further on that you know, by the fact that, you see, this is a whole side of, of Herodotus that I feel that I just don't, don't yet understand. The most obvious difference, look, I agree with you that the similarities between Herodotus and Thucydides are greater than most who study them see. I mean, certainly the notion that Herodotus is somehow one pole is an historian and Thucydides is the other, that's entirely wrong. And if you're going to choose, choose up sides in favor of either one on the premise that they're somehow you know, um, antithetical to one another, I think that's quite wrong. I think they have um, more in common than divides them, in fact. But having, and, and that is to say that for, that Herodotus too is a political historian in the end. And in that respect, he and Thucydides have a great deal in common. One would have to certainly answer the question of why it is that for Herodotus, the crucial thing for Hellenes to understand is barbarians. That only through understanding barbarians can they come to understand themselves. Whereas that aspect is almost completely absent from Thucydides. Is it because, despite the fact that he has nothing nice to say about Herodotus, he regards Herodotus as having performed that task and sparing him the necessity of doing it? I don't know. But, but ultimately, Herodotus is all about locating the Hellenes in the world, vis-a-vis -vis all of these non-Hellenic peoples, and locating the political, of which Athens and Sparta are both examples, so that for him, from his perspective, again, Athens and Sparta have much more in common than divides them, locating the political with regard to the various glamorous, cruel, bloody, violent, um, non or sub-political ways of life led by these other, which we could loosely call world historical peoples. Therefore, um, at the end of the day, I think that the, the opposition between um, Athens and Sparta um, is more Thucydides' theme than it is Herodotus's, though you know, the opposition between does figure in his work. I have the, the microphone. <laughs> uh, is there a, a super political dimension? In, I mean, I'm sure there is a genuine super political dimension in Herodotus. So, what is his that's your philosophical intention? And if he does, why does he proceed the way in, in, in the way he does to gain accomplishing it? Well, I, I, I do think that I mean, two of Herodotus' great themes are the human and the divine, right? both of which in different ways would appear to be broader than the political, though you could argue that the human comes fully into its own only through the political in Herodotus' understanding. And that's reflected in the fact that there are no barbarian characters, Though barbarian peoples have many insights that the Hellenes as a people don't, so that one can say that ultimately the Persian view of the gods and the Egyptian views of the gods, however diametrically opposed to one another, are both more coherent and thoughtful than the Hellenic view, which is a strange mishmash of the two somehow, though more Egyptian than Persian. You could say that. On the other hand, no barbarian characters in Herodotus seem to have the insights of his wisest Hellenic characters. So that, I think, would be one testimony to the fact that um, 
either politics is necessary um, ultimately for the full development of the human mind, or alternatively, the strange theology that goes with politics is fable that politics is necessary for the full development of the human mind, however little sense that theology actually makes. I think one could make that argument, in fact. So you've got the divine and the human. And then the question would be, again, what their relation to the political is. But obviously, the divine and the human between them raise the question of nature. Nature as a general question, which is very much Herodotus' concern, as you'd expect of anyone who comes from an Ionian background, who even speaks of the Ionian, the Ionians meaning the Ionian thinkers or philosophers, and you know, agrees with them and disagrees with them in various ways. So, no, I mean, you know, Herodotus is um, attempting to, he does seem to be um, a kind of precursor of Hegel. Right? He is attempting to provide some kind of comprehensive view of the world. Um, it's obviously not historical in the way that Hegel is. Um, so you've got these different um, world historical peoples, if you like, you know, existing si simultaneously. But he does, he does um, aspire to a, um, a comprehensiveness. I mean, obviously, the simplest way of putting that would be to say that you, the Hellings can't really gain self-understanding. I mean, that would mean to know what it means to be human. But to know what it means to be human means to locate yourself with regard to the, you know, the, the, the divine and the natural. There's a constant interplay in Herodotus between the divine and the natural. Um, you know, the, 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 so that the question becomes to what extent he's making a kind of mythologized, as we would say, presentation of the natural you know, on, on, on one level of his work. Um, but uh, I mean, this is, this is why, at the end of the day, um, Herodotus really is you know, a, a very difficult you know, writer you know, worthy of a lifetime of devotion. So someone in this audience ought to start working on him a lot earlier right, in your lives than I did. I mean, you, you won't be sorry, and you may do something for the world. Perhaps one more question, please. Um, yes, I have one question. Um, good evening, and thank you for being here. Um, well, um, I would like to share one of the thoughts which dropped up in my mind during the lecture. I think that there is a, well, defining uh, difference between Herodotus and Thucydides, most of all in the way they write uh, their books. So while um, Thucydides has uh, different rules to see through the witnesses' accounts, Herodotus, well, right in the title of his book, Historia, um, relies on every account, even indirect accounts, right? Because Historia um, comes from Orao, so everything that could be seen is worth uh, being written down. So why shouldn't postmodernist writers, scholars, academics, be interested more in Thucydides because of his scientific view and perspective on history rather than Herodotus. I think that maybe the um, focus of, well, the re re recent focus on Herodotus could be explained uh, within a political framework. So after the Cold War, we are not interested anymore in the realist theories, not so much, and we prefer to look at the culture, look at the field where leadership can be fostered. So to the cultural point of view, Herodotus uh, precisely, do you share this view? Do you think that there can be something um, well, comprehensible and understandable in this? Okay. Um. Thank you. I guess I'd say this. Um, certainly they do write differently. Um, and certainly they do follow different principles of inquiry. Although, while on the one hand, Herodotus doesn't say that he sifted everything in his narrative you know, into fine flour the way, the way Thucydides does, he does say that he doesn't accept any responsibility for most of it, right? So he's, he's, not, he's not claiming that um, these things happened 
as they're presented by his interlocutors is happening. And I think there's good reason to think that many of the things that he tells us, it's primarily um, so that we can better understand again how, how Egyptians see the world, or how Persians see the world, or for that matter, how Hellenes see the world. Not because Herodotus thinks that the way in which they see it is adequate or true. Now Thucydides, because he does make this claim for having sifted you know, the evidence in this sort of way that seems proto-scientific, uh, with an eye to producing an objective, comprehensive truth, um, offends the postmodernists, right, who don't believe that an objective, comprehensive truth is possible. Also, of course, they think of him as ethnocentric, because he seems to be so overwhelmingly interested in hell to the exclusions of other people. Herodotus, they credit with not being so concerned with the truth. I'm afraid, unfortunately, that that's one of the reasons why postmodernists you know, enjoy Herodotus. And of course, he's not ethnocentric. He's equally interested in, in non-Hellenic peoples. I think that's true. But I think that that's, they're wrong about Herodotus. I mean, Herodotus, too, is, in fact, trying to present um, an objective, comprehensive view. But it's an objective, comprehensive view of the different ways in which human beings live. Right, from which we're to get a sense of you know, what, the, you know, what, the, you know, what, what the human is and its, and its variety you know, as, as well as in what um, human beings have in common and to reflect on the interplay of, 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 of these things. So I, I think that um, you know, the, the postmodernists really um, would, would be less, less sympathetic um, toward Herodotus if they had a, a more um, accurate view of his undertaking, which I think is more um, ambitious than they think. I want to stress, by the way, that there are a lot of places in Herodotus where Herodotus specifically says that he doesn't believe in something, but then there are several places where he, where he says that the fact that he relates it doesn't mean that he believes it. And so the fact that he relates something can never be offered as evidence, um, sufficient evidence that he, that, that he believes it. And there are many places, again, where he corrects what he is told on the basis of what he himself has seen. That's especially a feature of his Egyptian narrative. And that, of course, points to um, the, same, um, the, the, the same turn toward philosophy uh, that one finds in the, 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 the one that the, the, the one finds in in Thucydides, you know, I, I probably you know, should have said this you know, better in, in reply to you know, Joseph Epstein's question that the the garrulous, you know, the the, the garrulous, unserious um, Herodotus of the age of scientific history has become the Herodotus who recognizes the primacy of narrative, you know, for the for the postmodernist age, but that I don't think has. Um, I, 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 th I think that those, those two views of Herodotus are, um, are based on a, 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 common, a common misunderstanding of Herodotus as somehow a more genial, um, less rigorous or scrupulous um, writer and thinker than he in fact is. Thank you very much.